So everyone should be joining us. I will welcome. It's a good afternoon for the ones uh, in Europe and below. And uh, I wish a good morning to the people uh, in the other side of the pond and uh, the Americas. We try to organize the webinar at a time zone that would be convenient uh, as much as possible for all of us. And I will give a couple of minutes before I start uh, the formal part of the introduction. So Hans, I mean, you're, you're virtually in, uh, at the Institute, but <laughs> practically, are you in the Netherlands? Yeah, yeah, uh, I am close by. Uh, close by me too, I am around, let's say, uh, uh, 10 kilometers far from the office, physically, okay. but uh, virtually I am in. I checked the office, I checked the office today, so uh, it is the same as my background. Good. And how how is it with uh, the Euro uh, experience? Yeah, uh, did you follow we are the not Euro doing games? that well. Eh? I mean, uh, we have all the coins now for Belgium. <laughs> for, for, yes, exactly. For me, I lost from all sides, from Netherlands, from France, then I am in between. Now I am in Belgium, I think. <laughs> <laughs> or maybe Switzerland. Or, okay, that's fine. <laughs> But you're you're still doing better than uh, us. But uh, didn't travel at all for this event. Yeah. Yeah, I think they didn't do a good job. In I, 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 well, individual they uh, are supposed to do better, but there was not real team work, I think. And as we are we are getting ready, and I will officially uh, kick off. I wonder how predictions would work. Uh, for our soccer games, huh? and if these catastrophic results uh, were predicted by artificial intelligence, I, I think either that, in short uh, term or in long term. I think Yamin can give a story about Beijing's network and Barcelona. Let's start with that: a story about uh, Bayesian networks and Barcelona. This is a good uh, warming up uh, for yeah. our webinar. As I welcome everyone that is joining. Let's talk uh, soccer then in that sense. Uh, I know big teams like uh, Liverpool and Barcelona, they're using Bayesian network too. Uh, they have a special team in uh, artificial intelligence and big data, just uh, like any uh, physical preparator, psychological preparator, then they're analyzing the data now, even to see who is the key player, who gets more balls, how to, to prepare the strategy and the tactics just playing with Bayesian network. And there is a couple of, uh, I know also even, I think IX last year tried uh, to do something similar, just playing with graphs and vision network, find probabilities, uh, the critical path in the team. It's really now is not just skills or physical preparation or money, it's also knowledge. Football nowadays is moving to knowledge in that sense also. And there is lots of science uh, behind yes. it. And uh, there is lots of uh, data science or computer science. Yeah. That's what I hear you describing. And I think that this is exactly uh, what we want to cover at uh, this webinar. So welcome at the webinar focusing on emerging risks and in particular looking at uh, emerging risks that are coming uh, to affect an overall system. And uh, it's going to be very interesting. Uh, let me briefly uh, say who I am. I'm Nikos Manuselis. Uh, I'm the founder and CEO of Agrono. I've been working uh, in the space of uh, food and agriculture data, data management, and algorithms that are trying uh, to predict or suggest things to users since 2005, which means 
a lot of years uh, I'm uh, working on the field. My PhD was uh, on agricultural data management, but it had a, a very important algorithmic component, uh, looking at the interactions of users, which were the information sources that were interesting and trying to suggest things that could be of interest to other users. So I, my heart is really uh, very close to the topic that we will be discussing about uh, today. And as an inspiration for this webinar and for some other webinars that uh, we are organizing with uh, other colleagues, is something that uh, about six months ago, uh, a colleague from the industry uh, told us in one conversation where he said, there are so many models out there. There are so many solutions out there that are trying to predict the future, but what they don't focus on realistically are the actual problems that we are facing. So plenty of solutions, but not clearly defining their problem. And this was the inspiration for starting something uh, together with some colleagues from, uh, from Belfast as an informal uh, interest group that now uh, is growing and is creating interest and is uh, a space in which uh, both people from the industry but also from the academia are sharing uh, experiences and uh, practical applications which is called the interest group on predictive analytics for food integrity. Uh, this is a group where we are sharing uh, knowledge, ideas, models, systems that people can play with or concepts upon which people are requesting people to contribute with uh, requirements or uh, uh, validation or other things. And uh, we have invited all the members of this group to join this webinar. We have uh, plenty of people joining us today. Uh, and in this conversation, one of my favorite uh, simple diagrams that help us decompose the problems is this one, which says that when I'm trying to answer a question, being it a scientific or a business question, by trying to calculate some predicted indicators, I have to select the right variables, the right indicators for which I will calculate their future values. And it's an important step selecting these indicators because they will be the signals that I will be using to give answers to my question. And then I have to go and see what kind of data can I feed into my model and which is the right model, the right method that I will select. And this is exactly uh, at the heart of what we will be covering today, asking the right question. And today the question is about long-term risks, not the short-term prediction what will happen next week or this month, but looking a little bit ahead. I want to welcome, to welcome uh, our speakers, Hans, Marvin, and Yamin Buzabrak from uh, Wageningen Food Safety Research. Uh, We're working together at uh, the Food Safety Market Initiative. We're looking into ways in which we can take advantage of lots of data so that we can support some important food safety decisions. And they're going to talk about two complementary topics, the scientific approach behind predicting emerging risks and the way that we can use AI technologies to support uh, solving such problems. This is the core of the webinar and we will have some time for questions and reflection at the end. So Hans, the floor is yours. I will stop sharing my screen and hand over to you. And uh, you can start by also telling us a couple of words about you. Thank you very much. Um, yeah, my name is Hans Marvin. I uh, hope, I think the first slide should be up. Oh, this is the wrong one. Okay. I hope you can see the slides now. 
Yeah, my name is Hans Marving. I'm senior scientist at uh, Wageningen Food Safety Research. I started uh, uh, working in uh, in uh, food safety uh, in 1999. Before that, I was working on the whole supply chain, uh, more looking at uh, industrial application of uh, industrial crops. Uh, my background is chemist. I, I've studied chemistry and PhD in it. And, uh, and now I, since a couple of, uh, well, I say seven, eight years, uh, together with Yamin, we started introducing big data and uh, AI in uh, food safety uh, research. And I, in this presentation, I will show you why we started with it. And, and, and with my presentation and the one of Yamin, um, you can see what you can do with it and, and, and how it helps us to be more proactive in, in, uh, in measures that we can take to prevent food safety risks. So this presentation is together with, uh, with the Yamin Busenbrock and it's called System Approach of Predicting Food Safety Risks. Uh, and Nikos, uh, thank you very much for this invitation of an opportunity uh, to uh, present this approach. Um, and, and I hope uh, all the, the whole audience would like it. Um, well, first of all, uh, say why I started doing this with a system approach. Um, and it happened really when I started working at uh, Wageningen Food Safety Research, or it's called, at that time it was called Recode, say in the beginning of two, 2000. And I will uh, explain you how it works and I will give you a, a demonstration uh, about uh, the methodology. So why did we start? When I arrived in uh, 1999 in, in our institute, which is dealing with food safety, we are an institute uh, that only uh, does res research on food safety, either for the, the government or, in, uh, or international organizations and also on certain conditions also for the industry. At that time, there were a lot of incidents uh, described in the media, had a lot of media attention, and that caused a lot of concerned by the broad uh, uh, public about uh, the, how the safety of the food, uh, European food supply was arranged. And, and, and so it was a big concern. So, uh, and, it, uh, and of course that also initiated uh, a, uh, a, a new uh, revision of the le legislation in Europe. Um, but that was not an ideal situation. And when I, uh, when we were in that, uh, and also our institute was very much in the analysis of, of uh, food safety components or contaminations in all these products. And we had a 24 seven, uh, let's say, uh, availability there, because when it is a crisis, we are doing the analysis for the, uh, for the authority. So we had to scale up. Um, so that was not an ideal situation. and. And so we were trying to figure uh, figure out are there ways uh, why first of all are we only uh, behind the facts and when we do uh, analyze uh, all the the, the uh, monitoring and the early warning systems that were in place at, at that time they were all hazard focused so they were following and measuring monitoring a specific hazard known hazard and when you find that ha hazard Basically, uh, most of the time, then, then there was a problem because then you have to take measure if it was a really serious problem. You also can, there were also monitoring programs and, and a system available that follows consumer and animal health, uh, the rapid response monitoring call. Uh, these systems give you a little bit more time because if animal gets sick, you know, okay, that is not necessarily food safety risk, but can turn into food safety risk if, uh, let's say, chemicals or uh, uh, treatments are used and, uh, and, and you have elevated uh, uh, concentration of residues. We realize that we have to think out of the box um, and, 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 do a, and, and, and maybe try to uh, uh, develop a holistic approach. There was not nothing of this kind of system were available at that time, so we had to develop it ourselves. So, what we did is is okay. Could be, uh, of course, food uh, food supply chains are not uh, completely isolated from the rest of the of the world. Uh, first of all, they are international, so there are a lot of connections uh, throughout the globe. 
So there is, of course, a lot of direct and indirect uh, uh, interactions with other domains like the science and technology environment, and climate change, uh, the, the, the government, the politics, uh, for example, or legislation. Things in legislation can certainly make that, that some, some uh, activities that you did in the past certainly cannot uh, be done anymore. Health and welfare, agriculture. So all of these domains here uh, uh, have an impact direct and indirect on the food supply chain. And when we analyzed all of these uh, past incidents and we looked in, 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 in whether there were changes or indicators that you could say in one of these domains uh, around the food supply chain. And if we were able to, if we would have known and, and would have followed those, uh, would we then have been in time to take measures uh, to prevent the food risk to occur? And we have done that in many of, of these, uh, 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 of these uh, incidents, uh, dozens of them. And, you, uh, and we found that many of these indicators can be identified either in science and technology, in human behavior, in nature and environments, uh, legislation, economy. Some of them are really direct linked. Uh, in the Netherlands, for example, on legislation of, of uh, environmental uh, release of of, of components. So many of these indicators uh, and related data were, uh, that were identified were generic, but also case specific. The conclusions that we had, because this was done by us in 2008, is, is that there are signals in domains around the food supply chains that precedes the food safety incident. However, we much more research is needed in order to identify these drivers of change, how uh, to model them, and, and also to consider the complexity, because all of these indicators, they have, they are, there's not a direct uh, uh, interaction that it can uh, occur month or maybe year afterwards, or, or, or also there's a, multiple, there's a web of, in, of interactions. A study done uh, uh, at that time, um, also related to this emer emergency risk and to identify the drivers uh, with uh, international uh, expert. Uh, and this was the result of it. Uh, here, the, 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 they were asked, uh, what is the most important driver of immersion food risk in your country? And this was a very international, I don't know exactly how many countries, but more than 30 were in full. And, and you can see uh, it was a scale one to five, and there were, and it was done twice two rounds. And you can see that war and terrorism were, uh, were identified as potentially drivers of a, an emerging risks. And the population growth was uh, uh, migration, uh, increased diseases, economic re uh, uh, recession at that time as well, also very high um, negative impact on, on, on the currents so that it stimulates imp uh, impact uh, emerging risk in, in, in the country. However, both rounds, it was seen that the technology, maybe AI, <laughs> would be a driver that could help prevent a food safety risk to occur. So that, that was a positive um, um, uh, expectation. So when you, do, so expert consultation is an important, uh, aspect of uh, identified indicators and drivers of change. And we have tested many of those uh, and also optimized which one you best can use uh, in, what, in which circumstances. So we can use uh, interviews, focus groups, discussions, questionnaires, Delphi method, um, uh, FMEA, failure mode of effect analysis, where you score the FMP, which is the severity times occurrence and detection just in order to rank the different uh, um, impacts of, 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 of indicators. And uh, we analyzed in a big uh, project and uh, which one you can use best and which circumstances for emergency risk identification. And that has been published in, uh, uh, in last year in Transit Food Science and Technology, if you have interest. So the challenge that we are facing is that we, uh, 
Okay, okay, when you have identified the drivers, there can be many, and uh, you don't know the, the, the mode of actions because that's often not known. Um, and also you have identified the drivers. You want to connect them with the expert knowledge uh, about the food supply chain, but also other expert knowledge about trade flows, about uh, prices and so on. And you want to connect that with the, uh, let's say the, the food supply chain. And how to integrate that? We started uh, eight years to, to use artificial intelligence to use that and to predict food safety. I, mean, I will demonstrate uh, uh, how this uh, out of the box holistic approach works uh, in order to uh, predict the food safety. Uh, I will use the dairy supply chain as example. And, and this was done in, in an EFSA uh, funded uh, project uh, called Demeter which also has been published. What we did in this project was uh, first started a, a literature search on drivers and indicators that uh, experts think have a direct or indirect effect on the performance uh, with the, uh, of a milk supply chain. Um, we, we identified experts in academia and industry in a country of interest in Europe, because we were focusing in Europe, and these are the major um, milk producing countries in Europe, in the Netherlands, Italy, Greece, France, UK, and Poland. We send experts, uh, co uh, questionnaires for the experts, and we ask them about a, a lot of questions uh, on emergency risk, uh, drivers, and, and indicators. And we also ask them to rank. Uh, in total, we, uh, we, we were managed, uh, four of them were rank, ranked high, uh, uh, within total 12 indicators. We searched for uh, data sources of the indicators and we were able to find all of them. So this is just for you to have an idea about what we are talking in, in this case. Drivers were an environmental, uh, in the environmental domain, the social domain, technical and economic. And the indicators which is say, okay, this has an effect on the uh, development of an emerging risk in the milk supply chain is uh, the use of antibiotic in the dairy sector, the average precipitation in a country, share of land use of pasture, we, we group them under environmental, then the societal, inhabitants per country, the average age of the uh, dairy farmers, urban population per country, and so on, and all, uh, economic, uh, the raw milk prices, the feed prices, the incomes of the farmers. And, and we have various number of data sources that we identified that will provide information about these indicators. Um, just to be short, uh, just to show you one of these indicators, and this is the milk price as an example, because when you have a data source, uh, you can also, we try to collect as uh, early as possible. And we were able to check back prices from 2008 to 2020. And for all of these countries, we, we, we see the fluctuations of the price on a monthly basis. You can do a statistic analysis to see when a price increases or decreases uh, above uh, an, an, a seasonal effect or a, uh, what, what you can consider as a normal deviation uh, that we call anomalies. And these are the fill dots uh, within these uh, graphs. You can see if for the, uh, all the countries uh, there are uh, an anomalies found. And our question was, isn't an, a, can an, an uh, anomaly in one of the indicators, in this case, the price, be a warning of a potentially full safety risk later? Here you see, um, as an example, uh, the number of uh, anomalies that we found in, in the, uh, some of these uh, indicators and for the different countries. So this is the indicator, these are the countries, the number of anomalies records found. So here we found in, in the period 2008-2019, we found eight, nine, seven, and so on. I will continue, make it a little quicker. And indeed, uh, with uh, uh, statistic, we could find that uh, these anomalies uh, have a direct link. And this is uh, an example of Germany and everything above this gray, gray uh, plane uh, is a significant co correlation. And you can see, uh, the window was uh, uh, preceded about 15 months uh, of a, 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 let's say a food safety incident as reported in Russia. Here's a summary of that information. 
This is, um, these are the indicators and here are the different countries. And you see for raw milk price, uh, there is a lag of, for in Germany, for example, of 10 months, uh, which are uh, positive correlated. Uh, in France, it is uh, 21, uh, Italy 22, all positive correlated, the Netherlands 10. So there is a, a time differences, uh, let's say around uh, more than almost um, between a, a year and, 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 and two months, uh, two years before this. Um, so this is uh, based on, uh, on data from many different uh, sources all over the world. Um, first, of course, you start doing it manually, but then uh, we, we wanted to do it automatically. So we, are, uh, we have now a workflows installed in our uh, high performance infrastructure that automatically collect from uh, all of these data sources the data, it cleans it, it checks, uh, it checks uh, uh, every month whether they are a week depends on, on how often it is updated, whether there are new ones, even data from uh, tables in a, a PDF. And uh, we have made scripts that are able to do that. Uh, then there's a, a the, the, the calculation of abnormality. And if there is an abnormality, then uh, and okay, this is visualized. And if there's an abnormality, an automatic alert is, is given. Um, we can also do the same uh, with the basis network. Uh, for combining that, uh, let's say uh, an, an, a basis network, I mean, Buschberg will tell you more about that. Here, the, there you can easily combine these different uh, steps. We also include a basis network in this workflow. That means that also when there's an abnormality uh, with the basis network, it also gives what type of hazards you can find. So here you get an, a year, a warning a year ahead. And this also says, what you can expect, what kind of, of hazard. Conclusions. Uh, expert elicitation in our experience is a crucial step in the system approach for the development of food safety protection. Anomalies in many different, various different indicators show a significant correlation um, between lag times and uh, rush after notifications. And uh, basically it gives you more than a year. Um, we have uh, created workflows. Uh, we use the open source uh, software nine that uh, allows uh, to do it all automatic and also give warnings when a uh, problem is at hand. Um, and it's, it, it, this result suggests that uh, early warnings in indicators can precede a real incident. We are not, I'm not doing that alone. We have a, a team of seven now with two new persons coming in. Uh, that have worked on this uh, topic. And I thank you very much for your attention. And if you want to learn more about what we are doing, you can uh, approach this website. Thank you very much. Thank you, Hans. And as we are switching to Yamin, I, I will make the observation that be, apart from computer science, there is also a social science component. Yes. I saw that is essential in understanding which are these signals that show that have a proven correlation and that we can use as input. Yeah, uh, you always have uh, to models. use experts. That's a very interesting uh, point there. Okay, Yamin, are you ready? Please unmute. You see, that's why it's always nice to give just a senior. Thank you so much, Nikos. Do you see my screen? Yes, okay. you're good to go. Super. Uh, just to put this one on the top and this one in the corner. Yeah. Uh, Nikos and the Guruno guys, thank you so much for organizing this webinar in uh, this uh, very interesting topic for us, which is our business, basically. Uh, I can introduce myself uh, shortly in that sense. I'm Yumi Buzenbrek. I work in uh, Wagner Food Safety Research with Hans now for uh, almost seven years together, trying to uh, implement AI and uh, system approach in food safety. This is really our expertise. We use everything that is available in AI and new technologies, specifically in, in food safety. We apply AI and food uh, and uh, machine learning to keep and make food safe. This is really our mission. Uh, and thanks for all our participants that joined us from everywhere in the world. I hope we will get really uh, nice questions and discussions. And thank you so much for joining us and uh, 
uh, giving us this opportunity to share with you our, uh, our findings. Uh, as already introduced by Hans in that uh, direction, I will just show you two cases that uh, we think are worth to share with you, uh, which where we applied uh, system approach and AI. It's not, yes. What I will show you, of course, is thanks to all these guys that uh, uh, things were really in practice happening. Thanks to Anand, Ninjin, Leonika, Lucas, Voter, and Hans. And uh, basically the two stories that I, I wanted to uh, share with you. Uh, the first case is about uh, uh, combining the system approach and the Bayesian network to predict food safety hazards in fruit and vegetables, like a case. Uh, the, then the second one where we use natural language processing and text mining to identify completely unknown things in food supplements, because in addition to prediction, like in uh, prediction in uh, uh, short term, tactical term or strategic term, which is covered by the first, the, the first block of the case, uh, we have in food safety questions, the things that are, that, that are unknown for us, really. In, in the end, I will conclude with... Uh, some uh, what we learned from these two exercises in that sense. Let's start with the first one. I think Hans already uh, explained everything about system approach. We, uh, uh, we see the problems in food safety. Uh, it's like a system where everything is interconnected. That's very important. Uh, where we should look at things at the wall right of the system, the whole food chain all together. Either just a group of independent parts, we say we focus on this, or just take this like uh, uh, parameters. For us, the system is a system, the food chain is the full system that we include in our uh, models. It means looking to the bigger picture first, then if you have a further or deeper questions, you can dive in. And here, how we cover uh, uh, the operational level and the tactical level and the strategic level of our decision. We take everything, and we take the historical data, then if we want to predict the long term is already in our system and covered for all parameters. Then if you have other scenarios or new questions in operational level or tactical level, they are already in the system. You can go with the system in, week, in weekly level, monthly level, or yearly level. It depends on the questions that you can, uh, you have. And the system, yeah, it's built like that. It's the whole system, the whole history, and the daily operations, what is happening uh, daily. For us, it's a full system that you can implement using uh, a Bayesian network. Yeah, I like this uh, first example. This is a few cases that we implemented using Bayesian network. Uh, the first one, as you see it here, it has like, this was really our first one where we learned from uh, uh, food fraud case where we were involved in food integrity project, which was uh, an EU project. And the, can you see here the name of our institute was Rikert in that, uh, that uh, in that time. And I like it, even it was small, but it was the first model that we learned from it. And from there, we start implementing the system approach and AI in very, very complex uh, uh, cases. And we have now like even more than 20 different applications in different domains for different questions also. And the one that I would like to share with you today is uh, the BN model for fruit and vegetables. And generally the BN modeling steps, as you can see on these figures have uh, four steps. The crucial one that Hans already mentioned is the identification of the parameters that you are going to uh, include the new model, then you go to target which data to collect, then collect the data, process the data, then you need to develop your model like a third step and the end is the validation. And it depends on your result of validation, it continues. It's a circle. It depends on your result. Are you satisfied with the result, like a quality of your model? Then if not, you need to maybe add other parameters or collect more data. It depends really on your, but it continues always. You can do better or improve or go to the next steps. I will to dive into each step of this, uh, 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 of the BN modeling part. 
expert consultation for this case of fruit and vegetables. Yes, uh, the first question, which factors are you going to uh, put in your model? Then we check the literature, we ask experts related to uh, food safety hazard and food safety uh, in fruit and vegetable, specifically companies involved in fruit and vegetable chain. And they identified for us the main parameters are relevant to predict food safety hazards like climate parameters, rain, temperature in the origin country, the use of pesticide and all kinds of chemicals that you can use in the farm level, agriculture index stress, the prices and the import and export data parameters. And you will see later in the model how many parameters and all the factors that we had in uh, the model. After identifying your factors, you go to the next one, uh, which is the data collection. For this case, we used uh, RASF data, uh, we, where they notify the different food safety, uh, food safety cases. I will give you in the next slide, like a short uh, uh, introduction to RASF data for those who doesn't know what, uh, what RASF means. We extract all notification uh, related to hazard on fruit and vegetable from 2000 to 2014 for the main producers or the main exporters of uh, fruit and vegetables to Europe. Then uh, the last step is linking uh, all notifications that you have in this database to the indicators that the expert defined like climate, agricultural data, economical data, and uh, all the parameters defined. As I mentioned, just this is a short uh, jump to what is uh, RASEF. RASEF is a system, a central system required by food law managed by European Commission and all EU members, uh, all EU national food safety authorities, EFSA, Norway, Liechtenstein, Iceland and Switzerland are in. And the objective is to provide food and feed control authorities with an effective tool to exchange information about measures taken responding to serious risk detected in relation to food or feed. And if you type Google it, just type RASF portal, you will uh, get uh, to the system and it's open access to, for everyone to see what is happening in food safety and feed in EU. In numbers, what we had like uh, notifications for fruit and veg in that period was around 6,000 cases. And uh, for the main countries like Netherlands and Turkey, India was around uh, 4,000 cases. And the main product was figs, pepper, okras, apricot, pears, tomato, and the main hazard, basically uh, mycotoxins, pesticide, food additives, and flavoring, foreign bodies, and uh, so on. Yes, how uh, we constructed the, the model. Uh, yes, of course, we split our data to training and learning uh, data set. We used 80% of the collected data to train our models, and we used machine learning uh, algorithm to build the BN model. And the remaining 20% of the cases randomly selected from the full data set was used to test and validate the accuracy of our models. And the accuracy for this one was really, really nice. It was higher than 96% in the quality of prediction of the hazard category. This is how it looks like the fruit and veg uh, Bayesian network. In short, how I can explain it to you in an easy way. Uh, you see all these ellipses are the parameters. The green ones, for instance, are the economical factors. You see yearly production, yearly import, monthly prices, agriculture, GDP of the origin country, zone area in the origin country, agriculture index, prices yearly. This is also strategic operational and it depends on your aim in your model and the production volumes, for instance, uh, yearly. The green, the, Orange ones here are related to the climate, like mean temperature monthly, precipitation yearly, precipitation days, uh, minimal temperature. And the green blue ones here are related to chemical use, like insecticides, fertilizers, fungicides, and herbicides used in the origin country. And the ellipses, the white ones are basically the parameters given in the system, like product name, the year, the origin country, uh, the month, and if there is above MRL or below MRL. 
And the output parameter, what we was predicting was the hazard category. And you see here, like in these rectangles, you have the states here, the hazard category name, and the green bars are the distribution of your probability. And the numbers here, like 26 uh, percent is pesticide residue, uh, 57 is microtoxins and so on. And like product also here, you see all the products that you have in your model. And it's the same for uh, the other parameters. How can you use this model? You can play the power of it. You can play all scenarios that you have in mind. What if uh, scenarios, what can happen uh, before or in one year, next month, or given the parameters that you have now, what is the most probable, most likely hazard will, be, uh, will occur? And how uh, I have some scenarios for you here just for a few parameters because of sick of time. Uh, here, for instance, I played a scenario where we import figs from Turkey and we made just a variation in price uh, from zero to 1,000, 1,000, 2,000 and higher than 2,000 per ton. And you can see here, this is the output, which uh, most likely chemical. If you have a question, okay, Knowing the price of uh, my fix today, uh, which chemical should I check? Or if your question also is yearly, uh, if I know the price of my fix in Turkey to next year, uh, this year, which chemical should I check next year? Then you will see here the effect of a price on your uh, outcome, the things, the chemicals that you should check. For the first classes, when it's about zero to 2000, it's always microtoxin, almost 100% then when it becomes really higher than 2000, really expensive, two times the normal price, you have foreign bodies that you see then questions of fraud and it's not only microtoxins, but you will have other food safety issues. Another scenario here is uh, the same country, the same product, but the variation I was changing uh, the import, the volume, uh, how much we are importing on tons, then you see, uh, for the first category from one to 5,000, it was microtoxins, then the second class microtoxins, then microtoxins. When you achieve a certain level of volume that you are importing from that country, you start, there is a limit for it. It becomes completely, you will have other aspect of hazard, non-pathogenic microorganism, then organoleptic aspects, other completely other types of uh, food safety hazards. And microtoxins becomes like uh, below uh, 40%. And you can, uh, what nice with this model, how we can use it. Uh, in that sense now for our authority, given the condition next year in uh, the origin countries, you give me uh, the temperature, the estimation, how much they will spend in agriculture, how much uh, they will show on which product we can give you 95% ahead which product you should check and which uh, chemicals also in your monitoring plan for next year. This is like strategic decision for one, for one year. And if you implement, as Hans mentioned, this system in real time, as we have it in our infrastructure, you can see any parameter if it's changing today, what is the effect of that one or which chemicals you need to check or you need to change your strategy which chemicals to change or which product. Yes, it depends on the dynamics on the market and uh, the influence of these parameters, how they are moving daily. Uh, all this work was published and, uh, you have, and they are in open access, I think both of them. The first one of a uh, uh, dairy case that Hans shared already with you in the first case and the second case, uh, it's open access, just type it and you will find it there. Yes, this one was about fruit and veg. Now let's move on to completely another AI approach, which is natural language processing. And to another topic, which is uh, food supplements. And when I say food supplements, it's just, yeah, I think all of us, we know what is a stimulant. It's a, it's a drug that uh, produces a temporary increase of uh, functional activity or efficiency of an organism or any of its part. They are used to treat obesity, increase focus or alertness, decrease appetite or decrease need for sleep. Yes, uh, what's the problem with them? The market is, is really growing, especially after the, in this uh, pandemic uh, period. 
the consumption is increasing, the market is moving very quickly, and there is a lot of fraud and illegal compounds are sold as food stimulants. And the issue there, if they are illegal compounds, this means they can harm uh, the health of the consumer, which becomes an issue for us, uh, like a food safety institute and for the food safety authorities. Then there we had some research questions, which are, are there other compounds that should be added in our monitoring? When we say monitoring, we have a set of stimulants that we are checking daily to keep our stimulants and food safe for everyone. And what is being used and are there compounds which are not aware of what is happening in literature is something, what is happening in the markets is another thing, what is happening daily also is another story. Then uh, the idea, like when we designed it, how to deal with this problem, we came up with this uh, strategy. Use text mining to mine Twitter, collect all the stimulants, tweeters, and use sentiment analysis and text mining to get something from there. Another data source was a European media monitor that collects media, uh, media reports worldwide. What is happening, sorry, what is happening in the world in media and mine that text using machine learning and concert with expert, you will get a set of new stimulants. And we use DRASF also to see which ones are emerging in that sense, like an information and knowledge. And uh, the last one that I would uh, give more details about it, which is using uh, scientific literature also, what is happening in science, in publications. And like data source, we used EuroPMC, which is a, a big uh, database, even bigger than PubMed. It collects scientific literature data with synonyms from uh, chemical databases. Let's go to uh, what we did, how we mined the literature. Uh, we used like uh, Europe PMC as our source of literature, which provide the signal point for access for the abstracts row, PubMed, PMC, full text and additional 5 million. It's like if you take all uh, scientific literature databases, Europe PMC is one of uh, the biggest ones. And our aim is to find new stimulants in scientific uh, literature that are currently not yet monitored uh, by us using uh, word embedding like an AI technique. All scientific literature that contain that contained one or more of the compounds that we have and they say synonyms in the title and the abstract were collected. From 1990 to 2019, and the result of the harvest was 2.1 million articles, which is in size. There is no scientist who can read all this material, and which is really a big uh, data set. And the word embedding model was trained with the, this data uh, to uh, to try to understand if there is any uh, new stimulants there. Uh, just here, a short introduction, what is word embedding is an AI technique used to identify words that occur in the same textual context. Uh, it's what is word embedding is a high dimension vector of numbers instead of uh, text and uh, converts all words into uh, a vector uh, of numbers based on all other words in the data set that you use to train your model. In short, we used where to VEC uh, neural network. Uh, to, then when we trained our word embedding model, we used stimulants like, uh, uh, like uh, a vector. And for, for stimulants, we find which compounds were interacted or were close to stimulants. And from this set, uh, the compounds from the original uh, four to eight uh, compounds, uh, the synonym, the set of the chemicals that we have in the list and the synonyms were removed from that. And the top 15 found compounds were checked for the uh, validity. From that, we found, this is how it looks like if you see your one depending projected in 2D or 3D dimension here, and the stimulant is here in the middle and you see all these compounds were, uh, were close to uh, stimulant. 
And from the trained world depending model assigned on uh, this exercise, 15 new stimulants were found. In addition to that, mining uh, EMM like a system, not the literature, but uh, the, what is happening in media, we using text mining, we found 10 compounds were completely new stimulants. This work was just published, I think, this week. And it's uh, available online in open access for everyone if you are interested to have really the details of the approach from A to Z, not just a short one like I gave it now. And uh, what I can uh, to conclude, let's say, as mentioned by Hans and Nikos already, AI and system approach are really needed, not only needed for us, we believe that it's a must in food safety where you can include all these factors, economical, cli cli economical, uh, climate factors and social factors, technology factors, all the factors that uh, are in the system. Uh, BN is one of the best approaches uh, when you want to use system approach and AI because you can explain it to experts in food safety, especially in food safety is a conservative area. You need interaction with experts. You need to explain what is happening in the system. And always they have new questions. Then you can play easily uh, what if scenarios and ask strategic, operational, and tactical questions in seconds and without uh, going back to build any other model. Uh, in addition to that, uh, using NLPs, we succeeded to find a way now we are developing this area, also finding unknowns. We did it for stimulants and we are doing it for other food safety hazards. And the same technology also can be scaled up to any product or a topic or hazard easily. You need just to do the same exercise and retrain your model. In addition to that, we had like, um, uh, you need to later on, if you want to make it in real time, that's, you will have other issues related to your infrastructure, the power of computation, data governance, what you can share, what you cannot share, and such kind of new challenges that are raising in food safety generally. Yes, uh, uh, again, I started with a team. I will close my uh, talk with the team. Thanks for all these guys who, uh, uh, really uh, added a big add value to this work. And uh, thanks for all of you for attending and looking for your questions and the nice discussion. Thank you, Yamin, thank you. Uh, I have a couple of questions and while I will be asking a couple of questions, uh, I will give the time uh, to our participants to submit their own in the chat. Uh, let me see if I can share again my slides. Perfect. Because my questions are around the practical steps or challenges in putting this in operational, uh, in operation, in daily operation. Eh? Uh, so what I hear you describing is first of all an essential step in involving the experts and their knowledge in identifying the key factors that can serve in a reliable way as potential data signals to consider in the model. So this was an essential step in what you were describing. I wonder how much time does it take to run such a study? If we want to look at a particular area, how much time do we need in order to decide on the key factors that we should then incorporate in our model? Can I address that, uh, Yamin? Uh, okay. Um, I, I guess if I would estimate uh, of the project uh, uh, budget, 60% uh, is used for this. This is the most important part of it. The modeling is and, and the validation uh, is, is the least part. Um, and, and we also have investigated to what extent can we used to uh, extract knowledge from the expert because when you have the Bayesian network, for example, you can also influence the direction of impact. I mean, these are only the main impacts that you see in, 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 the, uh, uh, in the figure, but you can also manipulate so to, to uh, infer the direction of impact, for example, if they think it is not logical. Um, often uh, the uh, uh, 
when we do that and the expert says, yeah, that's not logical. I would expect this and this and this. And if you ask him, okay, do you have proof for that? No, gut feel. When we do it, then all the time, the model performance decreases significantly. Uh, and, and we learn from that that, and we also have done uh, together with social scientists uh, also in um, a Delphi study on it. Um, and the reason for it is, is that experts are really expert on a very narrow knowledge path. But in a questionnaire or in a interaction, in an expert elicitation methodology, you ask much more, of which they think they know, but not 100% sure. And when you have a, let's say, a complex interactions where these direct path and, and, and the, the, the rules are not clear and are not published and, and well established, then you come into this domain and then we prefer to say, okay, we use the experts for, let's say, what things around out of the box things should be considered and, and, and let the data speak for them for itself. Uh, and because when we do it in that way, the models that we produce, when, uh, of course, uh, with the data set uh, that we use, that we have, uh, has the highest prediction, but also uh, it, it remains often very high, the same level in the future data that we don't have. Let's say when we, uh, let's say when we do the same thing, try to predict with a model that is four years old, with the data that is now, then we have, we achieve more or less the same prediction accuracy, except if something really strange has happened, like the COVID, for example, right? something that you, that is out of the ordinary, that has an impact in the whole system, that never has something similar in the past, then, then, then you have something, uh, then you have a different situation. And how much time does this take, Hans? If you start from scratch, uh, you want a month. Now you first have to identify, uh, first you go, uh, the first thing we do is literature study. Uh, so checking the literature, that costs a lot, couple of weeks. Uh, then you summarize and, uh, and then you have to identify, at the same time, you start at the same time, identify the experts uh, uh, in, in the domain itself. You contact them and you try to figure out uh, which uh, domains uh, they think uh, is uh, relevant. And you find experts in these domains. Uh, then you have to draw up a questionnaire. If you do the questionnaire, an interview is also really good because then you have a more interactive, but then of course uh, you have fewer number of experts that you consult. Uh, and Delphi is a different way. Uh, to do it, but that's more costly. So, but if it depends how much money you have available, let's say for the consultation, uh, easily half a year. So half a year and some investment has to go in identifying the initial, the starting factors. And then what I hear you describing is that the data can come and complete the picture, but we have a starting point by getting the, the yeah. experts and the right experts uh, in the process. Yeah. I also you, wanted to, yeah, please, I, I have another question that is also practical. Yeah, but you need to know which uh, methodology, expert elicitation you want to use in what purpose and when. So you need an expert on that. So it's not just sending out a an, uh, an, uh, questionnaire. I understood that this is clear that the social part, the social science part is very important as yeah. and complementary to the computer science part. And when we're looking down the road in terms of uh, how far you can look at, uh, you future. talked about, uh, yes, the future. You, you talked about the real time day to day updates of probabilities in terms of uh, uh, hazards in given product categories. What did your model show in terms of some years, months or years down the road? How far can you go right now with the models that you have? Uh, for sure, uh, a year. Uh, uh, what? But we haven't checked uh, all of them. We, uh, we have checked one uh, that we developed on food fraud, and the prediction. What we did five years ago was a forecast of something that was going to happen in the uh, in 
especially in China, we made a forecast of China. And we also made a forecast of others. Uh, but this case was in China, and we supposed that something was uh, based on the, uh, let's say, implementation of food safety regulation and so on, that some of the parameters and the food safety control will, would improve. And that was, I think, uh, six years ago now. But we, we, and, and we say, okay, suppose in five years' time, this and this and this a situation uh, uh, is happening. We would expect then this and this and this in the food fraud. We did the simulation, I think, last year with this data, and it was exactly the same. So the prediction was accurate. So for the typical question of the largest organizations in the industry that look three to five years down the road, you say that we can trust the models uh, enough, but it's something to further uh, develop. Yeah, Yamin? Yes, uh, you see, the question, as you know, in any modeling, uh, in any modeling is very important. What do you want to do your model? You cannot have a model that does everything or answer all questions, that's not possible. Uh, but uh, if you want to integrate the operational and the tactical and the strategic level in your model, you can do it by design in the beginning. Because sometimes, uh, like you see in all our models here, we, uh, we add a year, even the expert says, I am not interested, the year is not one of the factors. But for us, like an authority, we know we need to prepare the sampling plan of next year and the year after, then we need the year-like parameter to play the yearly decisions to see what will happen in two years, three years. We have the weekly one, we want to decide weekly. Then if you want to go to daily level, which is like predicting price or whatever, then you need to include those parameters. In that sense, you should know, in addition, I am predicting food safety, I am going to use it for strategic uh, questions. Uh, let's say it depends on your horizon. As Hans mentioned in food fraud for us, it was five years. We have it already, the years were there. Then, but if your strategy is one year, then you need to include those parameters like not factors that influence the output, but factors where you can play scenarios, what if in that sense. So I hear should be in your model. Different models or different factors in uh, different versions of the model in depending on the, the horizon that you want to cover right? the future horizon that you want to cover. yes and it depends on the complexity of the question the complexity of the question you so always start with may... simple yes then if you don't don't say yeah the, the ideal scenario will get max result from the first run of course but it can happen also that you will get poor results in that sense then you need to uh, separate the tactical, the operational, and the strategy from each other. Then you can put them in sequence instead of having them all of them together. It depends on the complexity. But yes, the BN is one of really, uh, in my in my life, like uh, a modeler, is one of uh, well, it's a it's a big machine, really. Yeah, I can say we uh, help to imp uh, implement it in other domains in Wageningen and where. We predict, uh, uh, let's say, yields. Uh, we predict uh, animal disease outbreaks, and, and, and they are quite accurate models with Bayes' network. So this is the um, the view that we have, uh, in especially looking down the road in large organizations. But there is also a question that is very, very interesting uh, from our audience, and I'm going to the questions from our audience that talks about smaller organizations. Because what you were describing in terms of data collection, training the model and putting the model in practice requires some resources. What would you recommend to people working in smaller uh, organizations like a, a small fast developing company? Which part should they implement or can they implement in-house and which part can they uh, use uh, from other sources, from external services? Or from your services? Uh, okay, I can answer maybe a part of the question. Uh, look, there is different ways of building a base network. Uh, what we describe here is expert-based way where you consult with experts, you need to collect, and there is data-driven one, 100% from data. Then if like a, a small company, he wants to analyze his quality control, uh, data, put them in the model to predict which ones to, okay, which 
uh, okay, I have a product coming from this supplier, which quality aspect that they have to prioritize, which ones to tackle first. If you have the data there, then it's straightforward. That's clear because you don't need, uh, uh, you are the quality expert and you have the data in house. Then yes, the BN can be really quickly uh, decided, just concerned with your expert quickly. You have the question and you are doing maybe modeling other techniques, then you know the question already. Uh, then that one is data driven automatically and quicker. But if you go to complex questions where you have uh, different factors, you need expert interactions and combining both together. I think also the data availability. Huh? If you have your own data, it is easier uh, and combined with external. Uh, and then it can be, be made much more rapid. Uh, if you have daily data or, or yes, and you can you can have also small models. If okay, if you are a small company, it depends. Okay, if you want to use it in quality check or suppliers before you import something, or uh, in your production line, saying which default or I can have in the product, then you are recording already your data. Then you can use just those parameters that you have in your daily data that you are collecting to predict and to become more efficient, more targeting, more everything better in that sense. Then it's straightforward. Good, good, good. Okay, thank you for the answer. And I think this was the question that we have in, uh, enough time to answer. We had enough time to answer from uh, the participants. Uh, I see people saying that they would like to, to contribute more and this is an excellent way to contribute, which takes me to uh, the call to action. Be part of the interest group, feel free to register at the interest group so that we can have more opportunities uh, for continuing the conversation, more webinars, uh, exposure and testing and playing with uh, systems and uh, models like the ones that uh, you presented. Um, I would wrap up. I want to thank both of you, Yamin and Hans, for this very, very interesting uh, set of presentations. Uh, you, you have put you have shed some light uh, in areas that were not clear to me as well. The social science part uh, was an important part that I, I didn't know of and that now I understood much better. I also liked a lot uh, the way that you have used scientific literature to mine the unknown hazards and the upcoming hazards. So to feed in the hazard taxonomy or catalog with new ones coming from uh, scientific literature. I don't know if you have any last uh, words, uh, closing, uh, Hans? It was an honor to uh, present uh, this and I hope it has inspired uh, people. And uh, if they want to learn more, please contact us and we are happy to uh, respond. Thank you, Yamin. The same for me. Thanks, Nikos and all Agrono guys for inviting us and for all our participants for attending and uh, for all your uh, very nice questions. Let's hope to see you in another webinar or wherever where we can share our results and discuss about food safety. Thank you very much. It was a pleasure and an honor to have you with us. I want to thank all the participants. Enjoy the rest of the day or the starting day and enjoy the month as well. And uh, keep in touch and stay tuned for uh, more things that will come. Thanks a lot. Thank you so Thank much. You. Bye bye. Bye.